today. There are so many exciting events happening in Eureka, so thank you for picking this one. It's exciting to see so many people. Maybe you guys are just as excited about historic demographic data as I am. We're ex-criminals. <laughs> <laughs> audience I'm looking for. <laughs> um, my name is Morgan Harvey and I'm the research assistant at the Humboldt County Historical Society. If you come into the Barnum House or if you send us a question through email, then I'm the person who is available to help the public access our collections and our research materials. But part of working for a nonprofit is wearing many hats. Throughout the past two years, I have explored and gotten to know the collections preserved and curated by the Humboldt County Historical Society. And the question that has inevitably come up and is often the topic of conversation between our archivist, Jim Garrison, and myself is how we can make these collections accessible to the public. Every day, we come across new, incredible, invaluable resources primary source documents, research materials, photographs. There are so many stories, so many graduate theses waiting to be told in these collections, but no one knows they exist. This is kind of the problem facing historians everywhere in the digital age. Research today, researchers today expect to be able to access resources online. And the questions being asked by graduate students are often influenced by the types of resources that these students are able to access and have access to. While looking through boxes and shelves at the Historical Society, Jim and I often find ourselves exclaiming, this would be an incredible topic for an article, or this would be an incredible premise for a graduate thesis. But students, researchers, writers, are not likely to find these amazing resources unless we begin to build a digital archive. While assisting researchers has been my primary responsibility over the past two and a half years that I've been at the Historical Society, like I said before, I wear many hats. And recently, with support from our team at the Historical Society, I have begun to lay the foundation for a for digital accessibility of historic resources from our collections. The project that I'm going to describe to you today um, really inspired and began our digital archive project. Last fall, we acquired a particularly fascinating collection Jim had gotten a call from the Humboldt County Sheriff's Department. A local lieutenant had inherited a question that had been asked and shelved by many lieutenants before him. There was a collection of historical criminal registers and mugshot books from, um, from the Humboldt County Jail that were being housed in the courthouse. The Sheriff Department did not have the resources to properly preserve this collection or to make the data inside these ledger books accessible. So they reached out to us, hoping that we would at least be able to house the collection and eventually make their contents available to local researchers. 
We are so grateful that they did. We immediately knew that this collection was special. In the sheriff's office, when we were picking up the books, we started to look through some of them. The lieutenant who made the donation was, of course, most excited to show us the mugshot books because they are so compelling. We have many portraits in the collections at the Humboldt County Historical Society from the 1920s and the 1930s. It was common for people, wealthy people especially, to have their portraits taken professionally. We've all seen these very poised, staged photographs. In Humboldt County, it was even common for group portraits to be taken of working class men and women at picnics, parades, and other events, even in the woods or at logging camps. But these photo books are interesting because the faces captured by them were not expecting to have their photograph taken that day. <laughs> of course, these portraits were taken in a very specific context, and there's an obvious power imbalance that is influencing the disposition of each image's subject. But there's a humanity, too. I think, when looking at these photographs, that we really are looking into a moment, into an intimate life. In addition to their aesthetic value, these mugshot books are an incredible resource for researchers. The photo books begin in 1926. The first book in the series of record books containing mugshots is marked Humboldt County Photos, book number one. This suggests to us that book number one in this series contains the first mugshot books taken at the Humboldt County Jail. We aren't aware of any earlier records. The mugshot books correspond with notes taken down by the Humboldt County Jail's registrar in the ledger books that are in this photo on the left. Handwritten notes in these ledgers de describe the crime and sentencing information for every person who was processed at the Humboldt County Jail between 1888 and 1942 a period of 54 years, over half of a century. In addition to the crime and sentencing information, these records also describe each individual's gender, race, nativity, and residency details. Demographic data drawn from this collection it describes the local historical community in more detail than census records, directory entries, and great register notes combined. Here is an example of how the mugshot books correspond to the notes in the registers. Miss Betty White, pictured here, was arrested for possessing and operating a still, which you can see in the line for her here, in March of 1930. We found her note in the register book using the booking number that's pinned to her coat in her mugshot photograph. On this page, we see other crimes, petty theft, drunkenness, reckless driving, transporting liquor, insanity, disturbing the peace. So a pretty typical day for most places in 1930. From these notes, we also learn that Betty White was originally from Iowa and had been living in Shively as a farmer for just over a year. After being held at the county jail for 15 days, Miss Betty White was released by the Justice Court on probation. There are thousands of records in this collection. Each line in these ledger books tells a story as detailed as this one. For researchers who are doing genealogy work, it can often be difficult to find photographs of our ancestors. Most of the time, we get these sterile and clerical notes, birth certificates, census records, maybe an obituary. Imagine finding one of these almost candid photographs. I think that these records are, if not as, possibly more interesting than a marriage record or a county directory note. In addition to genealogy work, this collection can be almost endlessly applied to larger research questions, 
about how national events like prohibition of alcohol or conscription during the First World War were felt even here behind the Redwood Curtain. Last year when we received this donation, I was inspired by the content and determined to find a way to make this collection accessible to process these books. The problem with historical data from this period is that it is often held within these enormous, delicate volumes, which are almost impossibly to, impossible to interact with as a researcher who's trying to answer a very specific question. I am so grateful to have received the support from the Tracy Memorial Fund, a grant from the Humboldt Area Foundation. Receiving this grant reminded me and everyone else at our organization that there are individuals and other organizations in our community that are just as passionate about historic preservation as we are. Realizing that there is funding available for projects related to fields within the humanities, specifically to history work, has inspired everyone who works in our organization. As I mentioned before, receiving grant support for this project has inspired us to aim our resources and intentions toward building a digital archive and increasing the availability of digital research materials and historic resources. With 400 hours over the past five months, I've been able to transcribe the first three register books from this collection into Excel. I have created from this document an index to the first two register books which contain complete records of everyone processed at the Humboldt County Jail from 1888 through 1913. This index is currently available online through our website at, um, and at our research center. The hard copy that lives at our research center is on this table over here if you wanna check it out at the end. The index is or organized by individuals' last names, making it easy to search through if you're doing genealogy work. The Excel format also allows researchers to interact with and search through these records in ways that just aren't possible when the records are in their original analog format. Let's look at some examples of how this data can be interpreted. As promised, with the title of the presentation, we will begin with sex. <laughs> When historical criminality comes up in conversation between historians and longtime community members, the first topic that often comes up is prostitution. My first introduction to local Humboldt County history was actually at the 2015 Historical Society presentation where Eureka Police Department Captain Merle Harpum spoke about the relationship between this city and prostitution. Two of my male peers in the history program at HSU had also written research papers about prostitution in Eureka. The impression I got from Merle Harpum's presentation and from the two papers was that women were regularly arrested for and fined for conducting prostitution or soliciting their services. So the first thing I expected to see when looking through these historical criminal records was just that many women being arrested and fined for maybe not prostitution explicitly, but for something. Here's what I found. Prostitution is on the books, but of the thousands of records, only a handful are explicitly noted as being related to prostitution. In the 33 years covered by the first three ledger books that I have transcribed so far, only 15 arrests were made for residing in, being in, conducting, having a minor in, or placing one's wife in a house of prostitution. <laughs> and only a fraction of these arrests were of women. On the screen here are examples of how I've been able to easily create graphics from the data that's been transcribed from this collection. The first table at the top of the screen here shows arrests made related to prostitution, but also for adultery and seduction, which are tangentially related. Seduction and adultery are no longer crimes that you can be arrested for, but they are evidence of how sexuality was historically regulated. 
The third chart here in all green at the bottom right hand corner of the screen, I've included to show how this criminal data can be interpreted to explore questions about gendered crime. Here on the topic of prostitution, a crime that's typically associated with women, we see that men and women were arrested at about the same low rate for between 1913 and 1921 for the crimes. This isn't really surprising when it's noted within the larger context of this collection. As we see here, a vast majority of the arrests made were of men. Specifically, nearly 1,500 men were arrested between 1913 and 1929, while only 29 women were processed at the Humboldt County Jail during that same period. I don't have any specific answers for why the disparity in this representation is so extreme. As a woman myself, I was surprised by these numbers, mostly because when I was doing the transcriptions, every woman I came across stood out to me more than the heaps of white drunk men on <laughs> described by the vast majority of the notes. After some thought, though, these numbers do make sense. There were hundreds of single working men who had disposable income, who might have been living in logging camps during the week, but came into town after they got paid, looking for places to spend their money. Women didn't have this luxury. It is said that women weren't even allowed in Old Town. By far the most common cause for arrest throughout the first two ledgers in this collection was being drunk. As we can see here in the table at the top of the screen, an average of 30 individuals were arrested every year between 1890 and 1907 for being drunk. This changes pretty dramatically after prohibition begins. The first liquor law violation recorded in this collection took place in 1913 suggesting that the first local liquor laws were instated then, seven years before the Volstead or National Prohibition Act was passed in 1920. The rate of arrests for being drunk drop almost immediately after prohibition laws were written, passed, enforced. In the bottom table here, arrests for drunkenness are shown in light blue. We can see a pretty stark contrast between these numbers and the table above. Other crimes, though, new crimes, start to show up. Violating liquor laws, selling alcohol, driving drunk, and blind pigging are all new, pretty common causes for arrest that show up during the Prohibition era. Here with the orange bar at the far right of the bottom table, we can see arrests made in line with the National Prohibition Act. Here's another way to look at how prohibition legislation... What is blind pigging? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, what is blind pigging? So the difference between a blind pig and a speakeasy um, is that to enter a speakeasy you would maybe move aside a piano and there would be a staircase into a basement room where you could buy a drink and there might have been music playing. Um, a blind pig on the other hand, somebody would move a, um, a photograph on the wall and there would be a spigot there where you could fill up a jug or something like that. <laughs> And I actually didn't see the word speakeasy used in this collection at all, but blind pig or even employment data listed, someone's employment information was blind pigger, um, was really common, so, yeah. Um, while you're explaining definitions, on a previous chart there was notorious Cohabitation, how does that differ from regular cohabitation? <laughs> yeah, um, so I included that in the chart that talks about prostitution and sexuality regulation because I think it's a euphemism for being in a house of prostitution, um, but I, I definitely can't confirm that. Um, that was the language used in the register book. 
All right, on to these pie charts. Um, so this is another way to think about how prohibition legislation might have affected the local community. Here on the left, we have a chart showing the diversity of alcohol-related arrests leading up to prohibition. As you can see, the data is not very diverse. Most alcohol-related arrests were for being drunk. The red sliver in the middle shows the second most common alcohol-related cause for arrest in the decades leading up to prohibition, and that's for selling alcohol to native or indigenous people. Selling alcohol to Indians was, uh, um, as well as bringing alcohol onto a reservation, was criminalized long before general alcohol prohibition legislation was passed. The second chart on the right I've included describes more complicated culture of prohibition era alcohol related arrests. We still see individuals being arrested for being drunk, which here is in orange, and for selling alcohol to Indians, but we also see bootlegging, blind picking, crime syndicalism, selling liquor, and violating liquor laws. Now I want to tell you a little bit more of a story. One of the rabbit holes I found myself traveling through during my time working with this collection. 171 individuals were processed through the Humboldt County Jail for alleged insanity between 1888 and 1913. As you can see from this chart, insanity was a much more common crime in the late 19th century than it was after 1900. These records from the 1880s and 1890s are fascinating. Local data from that time period is much less common than 20th century records. Individuals whose sentencing notes explain that they were determined ins insane were sent to the Napa Asylum. While I was working on this project, I also found a local mortuary record that describes a woman, Clara, who died from dysentery in the Napa Asylum. She was from Humboldt County. She died there in 1893. You shouldn't be dying from dysentery in a clean place unless you had that disease when you arrived. I found these notes to be fascinating. So I did a little bit of investigating into what it might have been like to be a female inmate at the Napa Asylum in the late 19th century. And here's what I found. This is what the building looked like in the late 19th century. I'm not sure if I find the structure terrifying because I've seen modern films about asylum or if there's actually something imposing about this building. There were five asylums in the state of California historically. And every year, the administration at each of these hospitals would submit a report to the California State Commission of Lunacy. The Bancroft Library has many of these reports available online, and I pulled this table here on the left from one of these reports. In the late 19th century, the most commonly supposed case cause for insanity in inmates at the Napa Asylum was hysteroerotomania or hysteria, which only affected women. On this chart, you can see the different um, supposed causes of insanity at Napa specifically. And um, most of the tick marks are one or two patients having that cause of insanity. But down here, you can see hysteria, and it's 51, and they're all women. And that's significantly higher than any of the other causes for insanity. The women in the photograph to the right are not identified, but on the back of this photograph at the Napa Historical Society, there's a note that says, after the morning's work, we sat. I don't know what you see in this photograph, but I find it chilling. The shape of the hall, the bars at the end, the corseted women make me feel trapped. 
the decorations in the foreground feel out of place. Like the hospital staff had gathered a collection of nice things and assembled them awkwardly for this staged photograph. The plants on the floor, the rugs, it all feels out of place. Some of the activities that were offered to female inmates were sewing and basket weaving. The report on the right from the same report referenced earlier describes items that were made by 83 women in one year. I don't know if you can see the numbers for production. <coughs> The last bit of data that I'd like to share with you today concerns arrests related to domestic mobilization during the First World War. Between 1913 and 1918, three longtime Humboldt County residents who were originally from Germany were arrested as alien enemies or for not registering as German Americans. Five of the six individuals arrested for seditious remarks after the Federal Sedition Act was passed in 1918, were also German immigrants. Three soldiers were arrested for desertion in 1915. Their cases were handled by the Federal Draft Board. I have been drawn to these ledgers because every line, as we saw earlier with Miss Betty White, tells a story. I think the applications of these records offer phenomenal opportunities to researchers who endeavor to understand the demographic makeup of past Humboldt County. These are some examples of how data from this collection can be used to tell stories about individuals, about eras, and about how <coughs> national events impacted communities within Humboldt County. I've shown you some examples of how beautiful graphics can be made within Excel once historical data has been transferred from its inaccessible analog format to a more flexible, navigable resource. Are there any other questions about anything you saw in the presentation? <laughs> Actually, before we do that, I have a couple announcements to make. Um, if you'll humor me for a second. Um, the Historical Society is hosting an event in downtown Eureka today at um, Harvey Harper's Car Museum. It starts at 4 o'clock and it ends at 7. Um, there are some flyers up here if you guys want to take those. They have more specific information. I want to encourage you all to go. I will see you there. Um, and then the Eureka Heritage Society, who um, they're a local nonprofit like us, um, but they focus on historic architecture specifically. And they're getting ready for their home tour, which is an awesome opportunity to get inside some of these historic homes in Eureka. Their event is October 7th, which is a Sunday, and they're looking for volunteers who would like to docent one of the homes. Um, you'd work for half of the event time, which is between 12 and 5, and then after your shift or before your shift, you'd get an opportunity to tour the homes as well. So Ann Fuller is here from the Heritage Society, and if you're interested in volunteering, <laughs> say hi to her after um, on your way out and let her know. Okay. Thanks. I'll answer questions now. Yeah, Pam. Uh, okay, what's the difference between not registered enemy? alien enemy and German objects. Who else is? It's a really good question. Um, that one person here that was determined or noted to be an alien enemy, um, they were also German. Um, yeah, that was just the language that was used in the letters. Green Man or something. No. <laughs> Are there any letters uh, looking at the Sedition with the, with the, um, the jailers? Um, what do you mean? Uh, the, the people in charge of the jails. Yeah, well these, so, the question was, are there any notes about the jailers themselves? Um, this whole collection was put together by the staff at the Humboldt County Jail, 
So all of the handwritten notes that are in the ledger books were taken down by a registrar who would have stood at the front of the jail anytime a sheriff or a police officer brought someone in. Right. Um, and in those books, who the accompanying officer, um, so whether they were a sheriff or a police officer or from a different county, we've got federal commissioners in there too, um, who brought the criminal in is noted. And then there's also sentencing information. So the justice that would have been presiding over the proceedings, whether it was the justice court or um, the criminal court, they would have, or the police court, um, that's noted as well. They're pretty complete. They're, yeah, they're incredibly complete. Yeah. Um, I'll take a question in the back. Well, it's just a little bit about comment, actually. I wanted to suggest that perhaps the notorious cohabitation referred to couples that have been who are not married. That's a great, yeah. Um, if everyone didn't hear that, she recommended that notorious cohabitation could refer to unmarried couples living together. And I hadn't thought of that, but that is absolutely possible. Yeah. Or some guy who's going from one to the other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's notorious adultery is another entry in there. Notorious and open adultery, if there were a few. Yeah. Yeah. Were there, um, were there any informal notes included besides the, you know, checking the boxes? Absolutely, yeah. These ledgers are full of informal notes. And um, what I did here to put these graphs together, um, I, I definitely took the most relevant uh, columns from these ledger books so I could put these together. But there's so much information in there. Um, yeah, there are all kinds of personal notes. Um, and the interesting thing about this collection and what I've really enjoyed about working with these books is that they weren't meant to be public. Um, so the police officers and the sheriffs that are writing about individuals in these books, um, they're not doing it so that the public will read them. So that we get to read through them today, we're kind of reclaiming our power, in a way, is how it's felt to me. Do the note tattoos with the book? Um, they did, there aren't many tattoo notes in these books. Um, I recently worked with a Pierce Mortuary death ledger, and the, um, that ledger has a lot of descriptive information about people who um, they were doing an autopsy on, like tattoos. Um, in these books, the only time that somebody's appearance is described beyond their race um, is when, or their color, that's noted sometimes, um, is when they're strangers or they're, you know, John or Jane Doe's and they're not identified, um, then they'll give pretty good descriptions of what that person looked like. Yeah. It seems like uh, in the late 1800s, the rules were a little looser about having someone declared insane. Did you learn much when you into that? I um, think that's a great question. And I'm really fascinated um, by the asylum institution in California. I don't know how representative the Napa Asylum or the California Commission in Lunacy is of the entire nation, um, but there's definitely a drop-off uh, after 1900. So I'm interested in doing more research into what happened. I think maybe you needed two people or a doctor or two doctors or something for a certain period of time, but I, I could be wrong. Yeah, a lot of, in these, the reason I started doing research about the Napa Asylum was because there were a handful of women who were brought in by family members. Um, so instead of accompanying the officer, um, their family members were noted or it was left blank. So they weren't actually arrested, um, but they were brought in by family and there was no trial to determine whether or not they were insane. They were just shipped to Napa um, without a trial because their family brought them in, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. Well, the same subject, insanity per se, wasn't a crime, even back then. It might have been a reason for a crime. If you have the intermix with crimes and then insanity as though it were, perhaps you want to change that a little bit? To That's a great thought. Um, so the reason that I did that is because I am transferring data from these register books. So insanity or alleged insanity is what's noted as the crime by the institution that created this collection. Um, and I think today we would absolutely make that distinction, but I think that um, the fact that it is considered a crime in this collection speaks to the era that these books are from. Um, it seems to me that it was considered a crime then, um, that these people were referred to as inmates, even though they were sent to a hospital. 
um, is interesting. Do you think, Morgan, that it might be because they acted out in some way? That's how they came to the attention of the... Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are... I left these notes out of the graph that I showed you, but um, there are entries where somebody would be arrested for disturbing the peace and alleged insanity or drunkenness and insanity. Um, there's also people who are arrested for being an inebriate and then they're sent to Napa as well. Um, and then on that table of causes for insanity, um, alcoholism, if you see the top four there, they're all related to alcohol. Um, so there were definitely other reasons people were sent to asylums. Um, I just chose to focus on the people who were explicitly arrested for or booked for alleged insanity. Yeah. So I think that too that the metropolitan system probably didn't go into place until maybe 1930 or 40. So there may have been a spread of years here where they didn't even know what to do. And then they, the psychiatrists were trained, and then, I mean, it was a horrible history, and it has, it has a horrible history anyway, all the way up to the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But still, I'm thinking there were some pieces in there, and they just weren't addressing that. The medical community wasn't even there yet. Absolutely. Yeah, mental health discourse has evolved quite a bit since the 1900s and the late 1800s. Um, and I, I would say that we still haven't come up with the best answer to this problem. Um, but the asylum institution is uh, definitely foreign um, from what we're, we're accustomed to today. And I don't know that either is the best. Yeah. 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 It's a hard issue to tackle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just a comment. Um, I think about hysteria, and at this point in time and age, where women were not allowed to work outside the home, they stayed at home all day, did the cooking and the cleaning, looking after the kids. I'd be hysterical too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And the corsets. I mean, there are some. I just chose a couple of these photographs, but the Napa Historical Society has incredible photos of the women who were living at the asylum, and they're still in corsets. <laughs> and this is somebody that's struggling with mental stability, and you're still strapping them into a bodice. It's really, yeah, I hear that. <laughs> also, the issue of menopause was being considered, I think. Yeah. It's actually listed as a cause for insanity here. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, I was wondering, is alcohol the only cause of psychoactive drug that was mentioned, but there's no other things that came in by the, the drug That's a great question. I don't see opium on here. I do see tobacco. That's a great question. And this is um, what I'm really excited about. I think just looking in these books, you read a line and all these questions come up. And um, making a resource like this available, I'm hoping that this encourages people to ask different questions. Um, you know, Now that we know this collection exists, that this is a resource, um, a lot of those questions that you all have can be investigated further. Yeah. Did all the graphical narratives get transferred over to the digital versions? In other words, if we wanted to read um, some writings that somebody used to describe a person, would we have to go back to the original books? That's a great question. Um, so I'll encourage you to look through the index that's up here. Um, this is the same as the digital version that's on our website. Um, and it's been made searchable by last name. Um, but all of the notes are in there. Um, so there's a section in the row um, of the person that you're looking at for notes. And so I've just kept any, any personal notes from this collection. Um, and if you're interested in interacting with this data in a way that isn't just organizing it by last name, but you want to look at crime um, notes specifically, that Excel spreadsheet is available at our research center as well. So you can actually interact with that data and you can organize it in a way that makes sense to your research question. Uh, how much longer is it going to take you to finish your project? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, so when we got this collection, I was really excited and said, I bet I can get through that stack of books in 400 hours. <laughs> and I got through three. Um, 
it's really, they're dense. And, um, and then, I mean, I did take some time to interpret the data and make these graphs and stuff, but there are four more books um, and they get more detailed as time goes on. So now I'm in 1922. So between 1922 and 1947, the notes are more detailed. Um, so it might take longer than the first three did. And I, it's so hard to estimate how much time that's gonna take. Good job, keep going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll give folks an opportunity to leave if you're trying to get out of here. Um, but if you do have questions, I'll encourage you to stick around and ask them. Yeah. I was just wondering if they were going to make a copy of the index books available for the homework room here at the library. That's an awesome suggestion. Um, we, I'm actually meeting with Carly tomorrow, um, as well as representatives from other historically focused nonprofits, um, and that will come up. We'll talk about it. Um, that's a good suggestion. Are, are there more police records available before 1888? These are the earliest records that I'm aware of. I think that the books we have in our collection at the Historical Society are, um, they're the only criminal records that I'm aware of. Tom looks like you might have a different answer. We have answer. court records in the attic that go in. Yeah, the court records aren't as early as these are. Um, the court records actually start in 1900. We actually have them back to the 1890s, 1870s. Oh, do we? Yeah, but they're buried. Oh. <laughs> so the yeah, numbers are just uh, based on the mugshot book. What, what was the question? Mm -hmm.